Thank you, choir, for bringing us beautifully into the presence of God. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we come before you this morning to worship and bring praise to you, grant that our concerns of everyday life might be set aside and that we might be able to hear, to hear clearly the word that you speak to us this morning so that our lives may continue to be in service and in joy for your kingdom. In Christ's name, amen. Our Old Testament scripture this morning is taken from the Psalms. It's a psalm that um, I particularly love. I will tell you that it is highly unlikely that you will ever hear the end of this psalm read from a pulpit because like a number of songs of great praise, it ends with some very violent, destructive calls for enemies. Not going to read that part, but I am going to read the first six verses for um, they're very, I think they're very powerful. So listen now for the word of the Lord. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there, we hung up our harps. For there our captors ask us for songs and, for, and our tormentors ask us for mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. And our New, uh, New Testament lesson is taken from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, the second letter to the Corinthians. And this is an interesting letter because it is in this letter that Paul allows more of his personal feelings to uh, come into the letter that he's writing. You can see it a little bit in some of his other letters, but in this one, the depth of his feelings about his mission and about the various trials and afflictions is very clear. So listen, if you will, to the fourth chapter of the, uh, of the letter of 2 Corinthians, beginning with the sixth verse. For the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown, shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also may be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So the death is at work in us, but life is in you. For just as we have the same spirit of faith that in accordance with Scripture, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we speak because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake so that grace as it extends to more and more people may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. 
Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabachthani. Let me say that again. Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabachthani. Is there anybody? That's Hebrew. It's actually Aramaic, and it's in the Bible. Does anybody know what that just was that I said? Raise your hand. What? Your daddy would? <laughs> Leela knows. Leela doesn't count. She's an ordained minister. <laughs> what is it, Leela? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, I do realize that it's October and that we are not yet at Good Friday and Easter. But it came to my mind, and I'm hopeful that it will become clear as we go forward what I'm talking about. Those are the words of Jesus on the cross and the written in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark. Isolation, alienation, and despair in the very being who was willing to die for us. Now, as I've watched global, national and local events over the past mm, year or so. Things like hurricanes, floods, earthquakes, wildfires, things like shootings and bombings and human rights atrocities and fighting and demonstrations over equal rights. As I've prayed, and cried as I fussed and fumed, hoped and despaired, as I searched for answers and begged for guidance and struggled with cause and response, as all of those thoughts roiled through my mind and my heart, a certain few words came to surface and they weren't the words that I wanted to hear. They were dark words, frightening words, but words that spoke to the events that I have just named and others. They were words like alienation, isolation, and despair. An individual does unspeakable evil, and that person is described as a loner, isolated, or part of some small, tight group that is set apart. There must be, there must be, in a situation like that, some underlying sense of despair or alienation, or utter isolation for such a thing to occur. And in the natural disasters, the destruction that has occurred that's beyond measure, that destruction leaves in its wake this very real feeling of despair and isolation at, as the import, the full import of the losses wash over people. So what are we to say in response? What are we to do? We're the ones who proclaim the joy of God's love and mercy, who proclaim the hope of God's sovereignty and the promise of new life made known to us in Christ now, friends, I know the answers to what are we to say, what are we to do. I know them in my head, but it is so hard to hold on to them when your heart is breaking as you look at what is occurring. This is my greatest fear for me and for you this day. And that is, in the face of all of this, we will seek refuge 
in saying, what has that to do with me? What has that to do with me? Everything. That's what it has to do with us. Everything. For that caring and acting is at the core of who we are. And when I think that, everything, then the thought is overwhelming. For I'm just one person. And we, though we may seem many, are in actuality just a few. And we are very often far away from the fear and the pain and the suffering. And even in our very own communities, it is possible to know every single detail of something that has happened and yet still manage to wrap around ourselves this cloak of separation. I'm one person. Each of you, one person. Folks, it'll come as no surprise to you to hear me say that there are many things I do not know, and I try to be truthful about that on most occasions. <laughs> there is much I do not know. There's just as much that I simply cannot explain. It is beyond explanation, beyond anyone's knowing. But here is what I do know. God speaks. God speaks even in the midst of despair and doubt and fear. God speaks in the quiet, after the storm, in the silence before unbearable loss. God speaks. God speaks to us. God speaks to us in prayer. The kind of prayer where we're quiet and we listen. God speaks to us in Scripture. God has always spoken to us in Scripture because Scripture is the very narrative about all of creation and God's work in creation to bring reconciliation and wholeness to all. God speaks of love and of promise and of communion, togetherness in the Scriptures. God speaks of communion in the stories, the ancient stories. For example, if you go all the way back to Genesis, to the very beginning, we discover that even in that garden, in that beauty, despair and alienation, separation from God, took form and substance, invaded our being. And you know what? That separation makes us aliens in a foreign land. We live here, but our hearts long for our true home, which is the heart of God. We are aliens, resident aliens in this land. Even God, even Christ, God incarnate, lived and died on the cross in the darkest valley of isolation, alienation, and even despair, such that he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Such a cry of darkness and of separation. 
in a less dramatic way, I think that that is our cry as well. For like the people of Israel in exile in Babylon, the question is, how can we sing the Lord's song in an alien land? How shall we sing before such pain and before such loss? How shall we sing? How many of you have ever seen the giant sequoias in California? Well, let me tell you a few things about those trees. They only grow on the western slope of the Sierra Nevada mountains in California. And they grow, do y'all know how tall they can grow? They can grow to 26 stories high. They can have a diameter of 20 feet. The oldest living sequoia is 275 feet tall and has a base diameter of 102 feet and weighs, anybody want to make a guess? 2.7 million pounds. One tree, the oldest tree. But the root system of the giant sequoia only goes down between 6 and 20 feet. Now, I want you to think about that. 275 feet tall, 2.7 million pounds, and the only root is 6, 7, 8 to 20 feet down. That's it. But here's what the root system does that's truly amazing. The root system of one tree grows out and the root system of the next tree grows out. And so through the whole grove of sequoias, and you know what happens? You can guess, can't you? The roots meet and they intertwine and more trees and more roots intertwine And they are connected, strongly bound together with that root system. Now, you know as well as I do that any strong wind that blows against a tree that's 275 feet high and has just the shallow root system is going to blow it down. Yet the oldest tree is 2,000 years old. 2,000 years old because the only thing that can kill the sequoia, not even fire can do it. The bark is about 30, um, 30 feet, 30 inches thick. The only thing that can kill the sequoia is if they fall, if they fall. If somehow, some way, that tree is not interlocked with the roots of the other trees, the tree falls and the tree dies. If they're interconnected, the tree can grow and put out branches that are eight feet in diameter and, more importantly, cones, seed cones that germinate into young trees. It is that interconnected strength, that joining together of those roots that allows a sequoia to grow and live 2,000 years and counting. So this is my question to us this morning. How shall we sing? How shall we sing the Lord's song in an alien land? Well, with apologies to my friend Stan, it's not as a solo. We don't sing 
in a solo. We cannot sing alone. We shall sing together. We shall sing as the body of Christ, together as one. We shall sing together in service. We shall sing together in hope, in love, in strength, in courage, and in action. We shall sing the Lord's song as aliens ourselves, but as aliens whose roots are interlocked in hope, and promise that holds firm against any winds of alienation or isolation or despair. May it be so. Amen. <laughs>